Hi everybody, my name is Dr. Fonseca and this is a presentation for the ITNG 2020 conference. The paper we are going to be talking about is the state of reproducible research in computer science. So first we're going to give you a little bit of an introduction on why we came up with doing this paper and which is reproducible research. And then we're gonna talk about the difficulties of reproducible research, some of the challenges associated with it, then a survey that we conducted here at UNLB. And then we are going to suggest some solutions. We're gonna focus specifically on talking about container technology, and then we will conclude the presentation. So let's start at why we came up with this paper. Uh, we were working on an OCR system, and as one should do before writing a paper or doing any kind of research, we wanted to do our background and we wanted to see what the current state of the art technology was in the OCR systems that we were looking at. And it turns out that we hit a huge roadblock when we try to reproduce other people's work. It didn't have to be specifically with OCR, but we found that when I read a paper and we went and asked those people, uh, hey, do you have the, the code for this? Or how do I actually reproduce your research so that then I can try to tweak it and experiment my own things? And it was either hard to get in, in touch with the people. And when we actually got a hold of some people, then they were like, well, yeah, that was done by some grad student or by some faculty that is no longer working here, or they move on, or they lost the project, or essentially they can't find the data. And so, that usually was the general case. And so we started to see, well, this is an ongoing problem that is not just focused on our field. As we read more, there we found that a lot of people were running into these same problems. In fact, some people are saying that we are actually in a crisis, aside from COVID-19, we are in a crisis of reproducibility. Whether the research that we're doing is actually reproducible is a big problem, not just for computer science, but in general. Uh, the main problems that we were facing in computer science was code related. There was no code for somebody's implementation, or there was no data, whether because it was copyrighted, which is a perfectly fair reason, or they simply didn't have the data anymore. And so because of that, could you really prove the claims that you made when you're, you said, my algorithm has 80% accuracy on this? but I can't prove it to you because I can't show you my data because it's copyrighted or because I no longer have it or because the one time I ran it, it gave me this really, really great output, but when you actually get to run it, it's not that good. And you'd be surprised how often that happened. It was just like the little comic says there, you know, step one, uh, install GCC. Step two, run entire algorithm and get everything done. Step three, question mark. Step four, amazing results. And you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You escalated from like installing GCC to like finishing. I mean, like. So let's kind of put together a list of the difficulties that uh, are in there as well. So we talked about code and we talked about the data. But uh, more specifically, it's not just that data is missing. Because a lot of times people say, oh, yeah, yeah, here's my data. And they just post the original data, the raw data. Or on the other hand, they post the cleanup data after they went some pre-processing stages. So it turns out that that pre-processing stage that you could have done may be modifying your results. Or the other hand, if, if we have just the raw data, but we don't have whatever magic you did to that data to be able to feed it to your algorithm, then can we create that same, can we repeat the same steps and get the same results? And it's much, much harder. So it's not just enough to say, here's the data of my algorithm, go and do whatever you want with it. No, 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 we need to have the raw original data so that we can see what you started with. And then we need to see the cleaned up or tidy data that actually it was what you fed to the algorithm because then you can be transparent about what kind of pre-processing steps you did to the data to see whether that was something that would be considered fair or that you're actually biasing your results. So that's on the side of data. On the side of code, things get a little bit more complicated. First, we have the, the most basic problem. There's no source code. We say, oh yeah, we, uh, we created a support vector machine and then we fed it some data and then it gave us these results. Here's our confusion matrix and our F score. 
And then we're like, okay, we want to run it again. And you're like, well, did you create a library? And they're like, no, no we coded the SVM from scratch. Okay, do you have the code for that? Yeah, you know, that was on a computer that um, when we moved, it got lost. Or uh, I don't know, the grad student has it somewhere on the internet, but we don't know where. So the source code is not available. Or sometimes they're like, oh, you know, here you go. I just found the source code. Here, take it. And you get just thousands of lines of code, hopefully in a language that you know, but there's not a single comment. There's no documentation on how to run the code even. So like, what do I do? I just have a bunch of code. It's like getting the uh, blueprints to an entire city when you're just trying to build a single building. And not just that, but they're just pictures without the uh, instructions. And you're like, um, okay. So that's another problem. Or furthermore, suppose that they run the support vector machine, but they use scikit-learn. Okay. Scikit-learn is being updated right now, but is it going to be there in 20 or 50 years? Is there going to be something else coming out? There's a lot of different libraries or software that may, you may have partially used in your program that is no longer available. And so even if you have your best user source code is well documented, but it needs these dependencies that, you know, there's a, it, you, you're using a library like Liebenstein set a distance, you know, and it worked back in your system with that specific hardware, but then I'm trying to run it and I can't even download the library. I can't even find it. And if I do, maybe it's not even compatible any longer. It's no longer supported. And so again, I'm back to square one. I can't run your program. So, I'm not saying that these are things that are people are intentionally doing to say hide shady research. It's just things that we may not be considering because we're trying to get things done as quickly as possible. And so that brings us to the reason on um, why reproducible research is not easy. Uh, as Kohlberg says, only a quarter of the articles published are actually reproducible. Why is that? Well, I told you about the reasons why some research may not be reproducible, but let's talk about like why they don't go ahead and give their source code or give their data or actually take time to, you know, give the attached software. And what we find are that one of the major reasons is because authors don't want to be criticized for polished or buggy code. You know, we write the code quickly. We're trying to, you know, hit the deadline before a conference or anything. And, you know, it works. It compiles, you know, you got the results, you're good. It's nasty code. You're not happy about it. You just kind of hide it under the rug and say it worked, but nobody look at it, please. And so there's that sort of fear that you will be criticized because of your code. On the other hand, a lot of people say, wow, I just did this really cool thing. I could make money off of it. So why release the source code? Maybe I can make this into an app or into some um, software. And so they're afraid that they don't want to turn that possibility away and of the monetary gain that they could have from that code so they don't publish it. And whether or not they actually go and capitalize on that, you know, they still don't publish it. And maybe they will someday, but more than likely they don't. And then the code is still never published. On the side of data, as I was saying, that data could be copyrighted. It could be data that is secure. So for example, when you're doing medical research, you have cancer, cancer data and that data may be sensitive because there might be personally identifiable information or something like that. And in those cases, there's, you, there's nothing you can do. You can at the very least say, okay, the data came from this people, please request it at this organization. And then once you have that, then actually take that exact data as it is and feed it to this pre-processing stage so that it prepares it and everything. Those are the things that you could do, but ultimately people don't, don't go and do that. And ultimately, as I was saying, even if you provide as much things as you can, and you give all the source code, you give all the data, you give all the dependencies, every single library, you include a copy of it, and the thing still doesn't run. Why? Because you ran it in, in the 90s with a really old hardware that no longer exists. And so now you, you can't even compile the code. Or on the other hand, you may have used some very specialized hardware like a supercomputer, and you know that's, that's unfortunate. Not everybody has access to a supercomputer. And I'm not saying that there's an easy solution to that, but it is one of the reasons why research is sometimes not reproducible. So we, uh, we went ahead and we did a survey uh, to graduate students and, and some faculty at uh, UNLB to find out what they think about what is known as the reproducible crisis, which is 
the issue that we have only a quarter of the articles being reproducible. And so we ask them, have you ever had difficulty replicating somebody else's experiment from a publication or paper? And as you see there, we found out that 58% of them said yes. The amount of people surveyed were approximately, a little bit over 100, but we listed there as 100, um, just to, to, to be safe. Um, I believe it was something like 104 at the end of the day. But uh, as you can see there, that question is not very uh, definite whether, you know, yeah, half of people, a little bit over half of people said, yeah, we had some trouble, but we didn't ask us to the reason why. So then we went ahead and go went a little bit further and asked them to the same people that this, the, the first question we said, have you ever read a paper that did not include or provide the data used in an experiment? And in that case, we found out that 89% of the correspondents said yes. We, we read a paper where the data was not uh, provided, or by that we mean a, a link to the data or uh, somewhere where we could go and follow up on that data. And so that's actually very shocking, but shocking in the sense that most of us that are watching this have probably run into that situation, but still shocking that it's that high amount of people that uh, actually have had problems. So it's not just, and by the way, this survey was not strictly computer science students. They were any graduate student. And so from there, uh, we had some rather interesting uh, research that we found out because uh, we asked them, as I, as I said, they're not all STEM or even, or, or, or just CS or STEM, they're just any graduate student. And we asked them, have you published at least one paper? And we actually found out that pretty much two thirds of them said that they've never published a paper. And uh, of those that did publish a paper, we asked them if you had published data. And it seems it's a very good sign that we're definitely above what we're looking at here because we had that 80% of them almost said that they had published the data and that they published everything required to publish the research. It turns out that uh, the same amount of people that answered yes to the first question answered yes to the second one, which means that if somebody's thinking about publishing their data, they already think about reproducible research and ways of reproducing that. And so now I want to try to convince you on why you should join our 80% group here. Why should you make your research reproducible? And I think the, the most uh, important thing, and this is coming almost to the to, to theory, uh, like John Nash style is whatever is good for you and whatever is good for the group is good. So if something is good for the academic community that's also good for you, then there's no reason why you shouldn't do it. And it turns out that that's the case with reproducible research. Reproducible data is far more cited and used in the scientific community than research that's not reproducible. And this this is common sense if we, want, if we think about it. If, if I read a paper and I can easily see the source code and run the code and reproduce the exact experiment with the same results, then I can go and use it as a starting point to do any modifications. And then if I go in and publish my research from that, I'm going to cite the, the original paper that I read and the experiment that I ran. And that is far more easier to get to that stage than it is if I read somebody's paper. There's not really any uh, easy rep rep reproducible uh, experiment. And then I might still try to move on into that subject, but how much of that information was actually useful if I didn't actually run their experiment, you know, and in my, you know, they should cite it if they read it and if it helped them, but ultimately they may just look at that paper and be like, eh, I don't really want to go further because there's no data available. There's no code available. So why really get in depth with this paper? If I can go to a paper where I can actually be running the experiment ready to go in, in a couple of hours or hopefully less. And so ultimately, if we think about, what our purpose is as researchers is to push the field that is that and, and build upon what our previous colleagues have done in the past. We want to expand and push the frontier of what is of what we can do. And the only way that we can do that is to build on other people's work. And those building blocks have to be stable and they have to be strong. And we can achieve that with reproducible research. Furthermore, transparency and the way the data is handled helps to avoid risk of anybody being accused as in finessing their data to their advantage to look good. If I come up with this really, really good algorithm 
uh, that can, you know, machine learning algorithm that has very, very high accuracy and precision and recall. And people question me, oh yeah, well, how, how is that? Are you sure about that? And then you can tell them, well, yeah, here's my code. Here's the data that I ran it on. You can do it yourself. And because you have the code, you can run it on your own data. And there's transparency in that versus saying, oh yeah, yeah, yeah I achieved the 95% OCR error correction, but you're gonna have to believe me on that because I don't have the code or the data that I ran it on. And so transparency is very, very important. And we, I don't want to call out anybody, but we read a paper that somebody else wrote where they checked what was actually a state-of-the-art algorithm, the one that everybody thought is, this is the best thing, this is the best one, the, the best that it could do for this, for this uh, specific subject. And so these people were really focusing on trying to improve that a little bit. And uh, they contacted the researchers who did it and they were like, yeah, we don't, we don't have to go. They, they were actually kind of evasive about it as, as they reported on that paper. And uh, it turns out that they either were very bad at remembering things or there was probably some finessing they didn't want to reveal that had happened there. And this was state of the art, what everybody assumed was like the best. And they just, they believed them because these guys were not, it wasn't some random obscure university. They were respectable people in respectable place. And yet you can see this doesn't just happen in the middle of nowhere university. This is happening in, in big places. And ultimately, if, if, if I haven't convinced you so far about reproducible research, uh, think about it for your own sake. If you ever want to come back to your work and reference it, reference yourself or improve it for a later project, it's far more easier for you to be able to come back to your own work if it's reproducible than you trying to rebuild what you did possibly a few years ago or more. And so what are some solutions to the problems that I've mentioned with data and code and dependencies and all these things? Well, some of the things that we have seen that people use and that are pretty successful are, are things such as uh, repository systems like Git and Git, you know, the, the idea of Git or websites that hold Git repositories like GitHub, they are very, very useful and they're decentralized because they allow anybody to have the data or anybody to have the code. However, Git and GitHub are public, and so sometimes people don't want that to be the case. So there are other alternatives. There is also places where you can hold data in a semi-secure way, and those are things like Sonodo. And Sonodo, you can submit code and data to them, and then they will hold it. And then um, you can make it public, or you can also make it accessible depending on specific permissions. So that even if you're using data that is copyrighted, they can keep a copy of it secure. And then only if the other person has right to access it, then they can go in there. If they don't, then they don't access it, but at least it's there. So if you ever, ever are questioned on it, you have it accessible in some case that something was to happen to the original provider of the data. The other idea is the usage of container technology or virtual environments such as Docker, Vagrant, Maven, or Gradle. And my focus right now that I like to point out is Docker. Uh, we had a previous paper that we talked about at ITNG, I think uh, two years ago or, or last year, I can't remember. And that had to do with uh, Docker itself. And so Docker is container technology. For those of you that don't know what container technology is, it, it turns out that um, if you think of a virtual machine, which is a computer running inside a computer, you know, in a program per se, in that oversimplification, I suppose. Well, in that oversimplification, a container is a really, really lean and mean, like bare bones virtual machine that's running with the, with just the bare bones to run the uh, the, the virtual hardware per se in, this, in, the, in, the, in the very bare bones OS. And typically you're running this in some sort of Linux environment or something like that, but you can run Windows or other things if you, if you so deemed it. And Docker is actually very successful, not just in the academic field, but in the enterprise field for virtualization of any OS. And so... The beauty of this is that if you know what a virtual machine is, you can freeze a virtual machine at the current state and save it. And then at any time you can come back to it. And because it's virtual, it's not depending on the hardware that it's running on. And so you can store data, code, and even a specific state in your machine into this container image. And then anybody anywhere in the world can download it and run it and pick up literally as, you, as if you literally took the computer where you were doing the research just as it was that moment, and then handed it over to them and they pick it up from there. And not just that, but if they mess up something, they can turn off 
the container, open up another container from that image, and it's right again where you left off. So it's not only good for uh, other people, but you can also use it as a way to back up your work at a current state. And so it also helps reduce the complexity around having to install dependencies and all these things. Because once you have your container running that runs your project, you can share it with other people and they can all work from that base. And they don't have to be like, oh, yeah, yeah, you got to install these in these libraries just to get this running. And so in our case, uh, we were actually doing this with OCR Spell. OCR Spell was a program that was developed in house at UNLB for uh, spelling correction of OCR generated mistakes, OCR standing for optical character recognition. And uh, we wanted to, we actually had some people contact us from uh, from a university or uh, somewhere in Europe. I can't remember, like Finland or Netherlands or some, somewhere in the northern part of Europe. And uh, the code was available on GitHub, but they had problems building OC, building the, or running the program. And so uh, we decided to put it in a Docker container so that they could run it easily. And that was actually very successful. So uh, we, we ended up putting all the dependencies needed. It was a little bit tricky getting it all running, but once we did, we created a container, we froze it and we have it there. And now anybody can download it from Docker, from the Docker repository with a single line of code. And then another, in fact, a single line of code can both download it and start the container up. And bam, they got everything working, a VM, everything is going, they can just go right from there, feed it new data and everything. It is very, very clean. Even for a person that is, I mean, we're in the CS field. We're expected to know how to do some basic stuff here at the very least, I hope. But even the person that is not in the computer science field can, do, can get something like Docker running without having to worry about installing things, dependencies, or any problems. They can stick to just what they know, which is the science. So... I want you to deliver reproducible research. Do I've shown you Docker containers, which is a very, very good way of uh, achieving that. And uh, container technology in general is a very good solution. But uh, even if you're not uh, okay with that, I've also showed you things, basic things like Git and Zenodo and, uh, and the idea of making your data reproducible because it can only make your research better and people that base research are on, on your research better as well. Our future that is in research and computer science is dependent upon people being able to build on what we've done. And so a lot of people are working on standardizing these kinds of things. And it's very, very hard because there's a huge resistance uh, in what we consider to be the reproducible crisis and whether it's even a crisis or not. I hope that from this presentation, you have at least taken the uh, idea of making your research more reproducible. Um, not just for yourself, but for others. But I also really, really hope that you consider that if you if you do something that is cool and you publish it and you think it's worthwhile, then isn't it in your benefit to make it easy for other people to access and to be able to cite it and expand on it? So with that, I hope that I've given a, 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 a big summary of the state of reproducible research in computer science, and I convince you to make your research reproducible, not just for your good, to make sure that people believe that what you did is real and you're transparent, but for the good of research in the field. Thank you, and I hope you have a good day.